Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to this special edition of St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. Today's show was recorded before a live audience at the St. Louis County Library headquarters on November 22nd. It was a sold-out crowd with hundreds of people there to listen to Mo Rocca. Now, maybe you know Mo from The Daily Show, or maybe CBS Sunday Morning. Perhaps you saw him on Broadway or heard him on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Or maybe you just read his first book, All the President's Pets. He's done a lot of different things. But our conversation was focused on his new book. It's called Mobituaries, and it was inspired by the wildly successful podcast he launched last January. In it, he writes obituaries for people, places, and even things that have been unfairly forgotten or whose deaths didn't receive the outpouring you might have expected. I began our conversation by asking a simple question. What possesses a young man with a finely honed sense of humor to focus on, well, death? I think that a good obituary, and many obituary writers will say this, is really about someone's life, not their death. And I got my love of obituaries from my father, who was the most optimistic person I may ever know. And I think he liked obituaries because he had a real sense of the romance of life. And um, and I think a good obituary does sort of leave you breathless. It kind of, you know, it's, it's a tour through someone's life. Um, and I compare it to kind of the movie trailer for an Oscar-winning biopic, you know, which is usually better than the full movie. But you see, you know, the triumphs, the travails, and hopefully the survival of, of someone. So... Um, yeah, I think it's I, I think obituaries are really about life. And yet the one common theme running through these people's lives is that you feel like their obituaries um, or their death didn't get as much attention as it deserved. And so in many cases, these are people who ended up unfairly neglected, that, that history forgot them, or in some cases, on the day that they died, something huge happened that, that diverted our attention. Give us an example of that. Well, an example of that would be Audrey Hepburn. And look, Audrey Hepburn obviously is not forgotten. People love Audrey Hepburn. Uh, she died on the day of Bill Clinton's inauguration. And I remember that. I remember I was um, twenty three years old, and uh, I remember going by a news kiosk and seeing USA Today, and on the front page, understandably, it was dominated by the Clinton inaugural, but then down in the little, what's you'll know this, what's called the reefer box, the little box at the bottom about what's inside the paper was the death of Audrey Hepburn, and I thought, what an odd twist of fate that this great star, a lot of people are going to miss this, and I actually had the opportunity to interview President Clinton And I asked him, you know, were you aware that Audrey Hepburn died on the day of your inauguration? (laughs) And I'm telling you, he was stunned. And he said he was a big fan. He had no idea. He was busy that day. I mean, it's understandable (laughs) that that he didn't know. Um, And in that case, what I wanted to do is answer the question, why we still remember her? Because I noticed that even more than a quarter century after her death – She still trends on Twitter. She's all over social media. Young women put her all over Instagram. Uh, And I talked with um, both of her sons, and they explained to me the impact that World War II had on her and almost starving to death in Nazi-occupied Holland. Um, And hearing that, and this is not fan fiction. She actually did secret dance performances to raise money for the resistance. And then I went back and I looked at her films, and I really saw this this um, real look, this sense of yearning and gratitude that I think really is what made her endure and why, what made her punch through. Um, her original screen test in Hollywood – was not her talking about how excited she was to be in Hollywood. It was her talking about the war. That's, that's how fundamental it was to her being. Um, other Hollywood studios tried to create their own Audrey Hepburn. They found beautiful, talented actresses. 
uh, like Maggie McNamara, Susan Strasberg, Millie Perkins, but none of them had that experience. So that was in, in one case where I wanted to explain why she's still with us. But then as you allude to, there are people that are also famous, like Sammy Davis Jr., who I don't think are remembered um, – in the way that they should be. And then there are people that were once wildly famous, like the Siamese twins, Chang and Ang, that people of a certain age will remember from the Guinness Book of World's Records. They had that, that picture of them. Um, and they were two of the first entertainers in America. And then, you know, we only know them from that picture now. And then there are plenty of people that were pioneers, some of them in civil rights, a full century before the people we think of as pioneers. So... It's a range of people. They all have one thing in common. I'm interested in them. So I wanted an excuse to do a book and a podcast about people I'm interested in. So I did want to talk to you about a few of the people in this book who I found most interesting. And I got to say, it's interesting you mentioned Chang and Eng because this chapter about them just blew my mind about 12 different times. What first got you interested in these two brothers? Well, You know, when I was little, there were three things that kind of riveted me, at least. But three that come to mind were um, tarantulas. Like, I just was fascinated by tarantulas, quicksand, and conjoined twins. And I think that we're – no, I'm not kidding, though. I think we're all hardwired, maybe because they seem – they're people – but there is obviously something unusual, and so I think we're all fascinated, especially if we have siblings. Like, what would it be like to actually be attached? And as I dug more into their story, I r- realized that they kind of they, – they had such rich lives. First of all, they were essentially brought to the United States as indentured servants. Uh, they were discovered, if you will, in what is now Thailand, what was Siam, which is why they were called Siamese twins. And they eventually won their freedom. They married sisters and they raised families. And I, I have to interject here. I, I, know what I you're understand ask. we're in a library, but they raised families. Right. Uh, so in your book, I learned more than I ever thought I would learn about the sex lives of conjoined twins. Right. <laughs> and I, I'm wondering for our lovely audience here if you can just tell us just a tiny bit about what we know about how they were able to have these okay, families. Let's get some mood music in here. Now, the. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was uh, one author I spoke to named Yonto Wong explained it as something called alternate mastery, which is um, Chang and Eng married sisters named Addie and Sarah, and they had two different households, and they would stay, let's say, in Chang's house for three days, and during that time, Eng would go into um, what I can best describe as kind of a computer sleep mode, like a meditative state where. He was he was essentially unconscious, um, but it allowed his brother. And I think this is actually quite a beautiful thing: his brother to have intimacy and you know private time with his wife. And then after three days, he'd go over to Eng's house, and then Chang would go into the sort of that sleep state. The two questions that everybody has about them is: how did they have children, and how did they die? And towards the end of their life, um, Chang, uh, who had a, a host of health problems, had a stroke, and Eng had to essentially carry his brother around for three years. So it's a really heartbreaking story. But they settled in North Carolina. The mountains of North Carolina reminded them of the landscape um, that they were raised in. And they sired. They raised 21 children. Chang had 10. Ang edged him out with 11. <laughs> sibling rivalry. And, uh, and then, and so here you have this story that up until this point, you're really, really rooting for them. I mean, it's extraordinary. They've won their freedom. They've, they've married. They've raised children. They're running a, a farm in the South, an antebellum South, and then they own slaves. And that's the part of the story where, for me, I kind of hit a brick wall, and I thought, oh, I was loving you up until this moment. Um, But it's also what makes the story, I think, more important and a richer story, obviously a more complicated story. Um, They were, in in the words of Yonte Wong, they were honorary honorary whites. They aspired to be Southern gentlemen, and that's what that meant then. Um, 
and I and I wanted and and I think it made the story more important. Um, the Civil War, obviously, the South lost, and they had put all their money in Confederate war bonds, and they had to after the war go back on the road. They were cleaned out, and they had to go back and work with P.T. Barnum, and they were humiliated, and it was a really a sad a- end to their lives. But I kind of felt it was one of those stories that packed everything in. It was a story about immigration. It was a story about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, a, a great story of survival and family, and then it has this dark side. And, um, and it's a messy story, and um, I think I, I like messy stories, and I think that there's a tendency in the culture, uh, kind of harshness to disqualify people of the past and look at them as backward, and I think I'd rather – Look at figures and take them for who they are, um, and even be generous. and their And their lives were extraordinary. I mean, that's undeniable. And you got to talk to some of their descendants. Um, how did they feel as they looked back on their great 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 grandfather's lives? Well, what made the story for me really additionally interesting was um, their descendants went through their own journey. I mean, Chang and Eng had this amazing journey from across the other side of the planet. Their own children for generations had been ashamed, and partly it was that um, everyone – when you hear about the conjoined twins and you realize they had families, everyone's instantly thinking about sex, right? And I think that that when it – it's interesting. Their own children were very proud of them, Um, and which is really – you know, their own children who were half Asian, you know, half Caucasian. Um, I mean, they were very unusual. This is well before Chinese people came to America to build the railroad. Um, But then as it got into the grandchildren's generation, this sort of shame set in. And only in the last 20 years or so, there's been this big family reunion. And the the descendants now, six and seven generations on or whatever, are now looking back going, wait a minute. We're really proud to be descended from these guys who, despite their very real flaws, um, were, also achieved extraordinary things. We're listening to my conversation with entertainer Mo Rocca, recorded at the St. Louis County Library. Let's talk about another person that you featured in your podcast as well as in the book where you got to talk to their descendants. And I understand that you were very recently, again, in touch with them, and that is uh, the family of Billy Carter. So um, Billy Carter, I grew up in the 70s, and Billy Carter is somebody that I remembered as a cartoon, as the goofy younger brother of President Jimmy Carter who marketed his own beer That was so bad that Dan Rather told me even the dogs wouldn't drink it. I mean, it was that bad. And But to me, I'm a big presidential history buff, and I think that presidential families are like ordinary families on steroids. I mean, the dynamics that we see in our own families are magnified when we look at presidential families. And Jimmy Carter's family, say what you will about Jimmy Carter's term in in office, his family was extraordinarily colorful. There was the mother, Miss Lillian, who at the age of 68 joined the Peace Corps and went to India. There was Jimmy, who was a star at the Naval Academy, ramrod straight, teetotaler. Sister Gloria, who was Harley Davidson's female motorcyclist of the year in the late 70s, I think 1978. Then Sister Ruth, who was a faith healer, and then at the back of the pack, basically, um, was was Billy Carter, 13 years younger than Jimmy. Billy smoked. Billy drank. Billy played up the stereotype of being the redneck brother. Uh, Billy hated the press in a way that feels very contemporary, and would, but, but was <laughs> very contemporary, the way he kind of mounts off to Dan Rather during a 1977 profile. Um, but And I remembered him vaguely going on hee-haw, like doing belly flop contests, but... No one is a cartoon, and I wanted to know who he was, and so I talked to President Jimmy Carter, and I talked to Billy's widow, Sybil, and their wonderful six kids, and they all described a man who was hardworking, very hardworking, funny, complicated, a voracious reader who I think, by the way, was probably an asset to Jimmy in the 1976 campaign because if Jimmy Carter was sort of that city on a hill, that shining city on a hill, Billy was that dive bar in that city where you need to, <laughs> to go to and throw a couple of back. Um, but eventually what happened was um, 
the peanut warehouse business that they had in Plains, Georgia, um, when Jimmy became president, had to be put into a blind trust. And Billy was basically put out of work. And the guy had no choice, really, but to make his living being Billy Carter and going on these TV shows. He eventually got his brother into trouble when he began doing business with representatives of the government of Libya. It happens. And, uh, and so Jimmy Carter, you know, in the midst of a really tough re-election campaign, had to give an hour-long press conference. This is while hostages are in Iran and the econ- economy was cratering. Had to give a press conference explaining why his little brother was meddling in the Middle East. Um, but in the midst of that, Billy admitted that he was an alcoholic. And he spent the last proud chapter of his life traveling the country, um, ministering to people who could relate to him who were struggling with alcoholism. So what I basically got was a guy who, yes, was complicated and funny, um, but was also a pretty decent guy. And, uh, and I know his family was really grateful to be able to tell his story. Were they initially skittish to talk to you? I mean, it sounds like he had been, become such a joke. They, mu- they might have thought that here you are just to, to bring up the laughing again. That's a, a great question. I'm not sure. It did take – it took a, certainly took a while for, for the pr- former president to agree to talk to me about him. Um, and I think the family – I don't know. I mean I think it was, it was sort of a coup that we got all six of the kids because they all had varying degrees of reluctance when talking about their father. Um, they're very, very open about his struggles with alcoholism. Um, and I think uh, ultimately that what they wanted to do was get the, that message – out. Um, but yeah, I, I'd rather be, um, I think there's something to be gained from looking at somebody like that and being generous. And I thought one of the most interesting points you made, and I think one of the most generous points, was when you put in context just how young he was when all this was happening. Yeah, he was, he was basically 39 with six kids. He's in this tiny town in southwest Georgia in the international media descend. I couldn't have handled that. And he, as you say, he had his um, occupation somewhat ripped away from him because of this farm going into a blind trust. Did you get the sense that he resented his, his brother's presidential journey? I think that the kids, as I, of course, couldn't talk to Billy, but I got the sense that the kids um, maybe felt like they're – they experienced the downside of being part of an extended presidential family and not not the real upside of it. Um, yeah, yeah. And and I was very like struck when when one of them said that she Billy Carter is the only presidential brother with his own museum. If you go to Plains, Georgia, it's the Billy Carter Service Station Museum, <laughs> and it's a service and it's really neat. It's you would really, recommend a visit? I really would. I'd recommend <laughs> it. It's really neat. It's 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 a tiny town though, and uh, and um, yeah, one of them, Kim, the oldest daughter, said that when she was working there one day, that a woman came in and shook her head and said. What a shame. He was such an embarrassment to his family and didn't realize that it was his daughter right there and that she said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. I, I, I can tell you he wasn't an embarrassment. And she said, how do you know? And, he, and she said, well, I'm, I'm his daughter. And she said, are you sure? <laughs> oh, the South. <laughs> the South. <laughs> Well, so here we are in the Midwest, and since we're in the Midwest, I thought this would actually be, um, we would be remiss not to ask you about your feelings of Lawrence Welk, who is, there is a good reason for asking this question, Lawrence Welk does get an obituary in this book, and I will say it was an eye-opener to me. I knew nothing about Lawrence Welk other than making fun of him, and you opened my eyes. I get the sense you actually really admire Lawrence Welk. Let me tell you something. Lawrence Welk was born in a sod house in North Dakota, basically a house made of dirt. Okay, It was a German-speaking enclave. He didn't learn to speak English until he was 23 years old. He spent dec- – then he told his father he wanted an accordion, and his father said, I'll sell a cow and get you an accordion, but then you have to continue working on the farm until you're 18. And if, I mean it sounds like a fairy tale, and it basically is. Okay, And he spent decades on the road – with his band, um, honing the sound that would become known as champagne music. He was almost 50 years old when he got onto television. He eventually was on ABC nationally. The network didn't like his accent. They didn't like the regionalisms that he was constantly pointing out where the singers and dancers were from. And they, you know, wonderful, wonderful, they're from North Dakota. And they're usually from North Dakota. 
they wanted him to have an edgy warm-up comic. Um, they wanted him to have glitzy guest stars. He didn't want any of that. They eventually ripcorded him. They canned him. They kicked him off the air. And instead of going quietly into that good night, he put his show into syndication, um, ultimately onto PBS. It lasted another 11 years with an even bigger audience. When he ended his run, it was the longest-running musical variety show since then eclipsed by Soul Train and he was the second richest person in entertainment after Bob Hope but that's not why he did it he did it because he knew who he was and he knew what his audience liked and there was a real connection there and he wasn't going to let anyone interfere with that and for those reasons I think that Lawrence Welk was a badass (laughs) and and it's a it's, it's a characteristic that we usually associate with kind of young rebels who say, I'm going to do it my way. But I like the fact that this guy that my grandmother loved listening to, and I'll admit, as a kid, I was like, oh, are we going to listen to this again? Um, and, and I talked to Fred Armisen, who is so funny and imitated Lawrence Welk on Saturday Night Live in a very funny sketch. Um, and he had similar feelings, and he said, you know, he really admired Lawrence Welk for knowing – what he was good at and owning it and knowing what the audience wanted and that Lawrence Welk would say, I hope you had a pleasant time. He wasn't trying – it wasn't about fireworks. He knew that what the audience wanted was something pleasant, and and I think pleasant can be a very nice thing, and it's it's underrated. So we also do have another mobituary that has a local tie, and it has a much stronger local tie than Lawrence Welk. Um, this mobituary is one that it's going to be an episode of the podcast, and it hasn't yet aired. Give us a little bit of context on this before we play it. We're going to play a little. This is a preview. This is a world premiere, a little bit of a clip, <laughs> a little bit of a clip of that's going to come up in a moment. Um, I am aware of your triumph of the last year on the ice (laughs) aided by a late singer who I was always a fan of and my best friend and I growing up were were big fans of hers and when I when I began reading about her role in this great St. Louis triumph um, I thought now is the time to tell her story, especially since um, it was clear that a lot of people didn't know her story and thought that she was maybe even a contemporary artist, a tribute to that song and its indestructible nature. I mean, (laughs) because it just keeps coming back and it never gets old. Um, And so, yes, Sarah, I would love for you all here to hear a preview of that episode. So if we can, um, let's play. It's a sneak peek preview of a mobituary for Laura Branigan. In January 2019, the St. Louis Blues hockey team was in last place. Dead last. All the wheels seem to have fallen off the wagon. There's a lot of concern around the St. Louis Blues. There's no doubt about it. There's no jump. There's no grit. There's no excitement. The NHL season had started in October. This is unbelievable. A couple of months later, their own fans booed them during and after a game. By January, their chances of winning the Stanley Cup were 0.6%. Not 6%, which would be bad enough. 0.6%. The team trudged into Philly to play the Philadelphia Flyers. We have a friend of ours from Philly. He invited us to this bar. That's St. Louis Blues player Robert Bortuzzo. He and four other players went out for some beers and cheesesteaks the night before their game. I mean, why not? You know what? This place is packed with characters. And there's one guy who just kept wanting them to play Gloria. Play Gloria, play Gloria. So they kept playing it. Gloria. You know the 1982 hit song from Laura Branigan. So the DJ kept playing Gloria over and over. And the place is going nuts. The guys wind up having a pretty good time. They go home, sleep off the booze, they go out the next day, and they win. 3 nothing, A shutout. Alexander Steen, another player, 
says they went back to the locker room that night and celebrated by playing Gloria. Throughout the course of a season as a group, you try and find things that connect you more. They officially adopted Gloria as their win song. And then... Bring out the Zamboni! 11 consecutive wins! They won their next 10 games, playing Gloria after every one. It wasn't long before the song moved out of the locker room and into the arena to the delight of thousands of screaming fans who were no longer booing. A local radio station played Gloria for 24 hours straight. 24 hours of Gloria. 24 hours. I hope you're not tired of it yet because we're not. Let's go blues, baby. Lifelong fan Jim Patton got a Play Gloria tattoo. So I'll be forever linked with the Blues and with Laura Branigan. And then naturally, fans started asking for Laura Branigan to come sing Gloria in person. But I thought, oh, it would be cool if they brought her in for one of the games. But there was one problem. She, so she died? Yeah. Oh. Laura Branigan died in her sleep in 2004. Five seconds to go. But in 2019, her chart-topping hit took the Blues all the way to the top. The wait is over, and the St. Louis Blues are the Stanley Cup champions for the first time in franchise history. That's right. In five months, they went from number 31 to number one. Worst to first. I will go to my grave singing Gloria. So who was Laura Brannigan anyway? Even her neighbors didn't know who she was. And a really underrated singer. Ever since she was a little kid, she could sing. There was like a little mischievous secret to that smile. And while I'm at it, who's Gloria? She's a little cuckoo. I'm not positive, but I think it's about a mentally disturbed woman. Was she a prostitute, Gloria? <laughs> From CBS Sunday Morning and Simon and & Schuster, I'm Moraka, and this is Mobituaries. So, Mo, I have to ask you, I know that we have to wait for the full episode to learn all the secrets of Laura Branigan, but did you get to the bottom of who Gloria actually is? You know, I didn't get to the bottom of who Gloria is, although we do have great sound from Laura Branigan herself talking about um, about uh, how she viewed Gloria uh, in general terms, um, it was originally an Italian song sung by Umberto Tozzi, and in the movie *The Wolf of Wall Street*, you can actually hear it. Um, and uh, and but she co-wrote, uh, adapted the lyrics uh, for the English version. But um, I did talk to a wide range of people, um, including one of her brothers, and uh, and who uh, lent a lot of insight into her life and career. And she was an ex extraordinary talent and i think it's and um and she was certainly not a one hit wonder i mean that there were there, she had many hits um but it's it's a it's a rich interesting story and i'm glad that we're telling it and i i, I hope that people in st louis more than anywhere else really appreciate it and like the story that's Mo Rocca. He's the author of Mobituaries, and he was just talking about his upcoming podcast episode about Laura Branigan. She's, of course, the singer who made Gloria a hit song. The episode drops December 13th. We'll return to the conversation after a quick break. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Welcome back. We'll now return to my conversation with author, podcaster, and TV correspondent Mo Rocca. It was recorded before a live audience at the St. Louis County Library headquarters on November 22nd. The final mobituary in this book is also a dedication, and it's to your father, and it's just a wonderful piece. Tell us a little bit about what he was like. Well, thank you very much. I found that when I was reading, when I was writing, um, I kept thinking of my father and um, partly I th th that so many of the things that I like came to me from him. Um, and on Father's Day, this past Father's Day, I just started writing about him, thinking that it might be part of the acknowledgments of the book. And then my editor said, you know, this should be a mobituary. It should be the final mobituary. And so I made it the dedication. When my father was 50 years old, my, uh, my mother 
um, went down to downtown D.C. I grew up in the suburbs outside of Washington, D.C., and she went to a pawn shop, and she bought him a trumpet. He had played the trumpet when he was a little kid and always regretted stopping, uh, but life interfered. He started a small business. He got married. He had three kids, so he couldn't play the trumpet anymore. And, um, and I remember distinctly him opening up the rectangular the case and seeing the trumpet, um, and every weekday morning he would go into the cellar with the concrete floor, um, and he would do his exercises. He'd work on his embouchure, which is how the your lips fit around the mouthpiece of the instrument. It's really hard. Uh, and then every night for an hour, he would go back into the cellar after work and play an hour of Dixieland jazz. And I would um, take – I had metal roller skates, and I'd put them on over my sneakers. And there was a pole in the basement so I could – work up enough speed and grab it and pretend I was doing like a triple sow cow. <laughs> and my mother hates this part of the story, but the the dryer had crapped out like in the mid seventies. So we hung our sheets and towels in the basement, but that was great for me because it was almost like Xanadu. I could just go in and out <laughs> of this stuff to the Basin street blues, which was an original music selection. I realized for my, for my, um, uh, for my performance there uh, at Innsbruck or wherever. And, uh, um, and, uh, um, and it made a huge impact on me because he didn't – he knew he was starting late. He didn't think that he was going to become a star. He didn't think that he would be you know playing in, on Bourbon Street or you know at the Blue Note. Um, he would play in, with his buddies. They formed a band, and their jam session was every Monday night no matter what. Nothing could interfere with that, and um, he would play at nursing homes and sometimes at a restaurant, but it, but it might as well have been the Blue Note. That's how – you know, I think it transported him. It took him to another place, um, and it, it just was very it, – it, it's it made a very big impact on me that I don't even completely understand maybe how it's manifested, but um, – but it was very powerful to me. You had a lovely insight in there about the personality of a trumpet player. I was so struck yeah. by that. What did you learn about trumpet players? Uh, thank you for asking me that. Um, I was doing a um, – I met a really good trumpet player. Um, um, uh, what is J- – J- J- there's a band leader in New York named J- Jay Lenhardt. His son is a great trumpet player. And I asked him, I said, you know, can you talk to me about – the personality of trumpet players or I don't know. I was just talking to him a little bit about my father and this was before I wasn't even really thinking about, <clears throat> about a writing a dedication to him. And he said, well, the thing about trumpet players is you have to be really bold. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, if you bust a note, you can't hide it. If you're a saxophonist or a clarinetist and you bust a note, you can cover it up. It's easy to cover it up, or a pianist, but you can't do that. If you're a trumpet player, you're putting yourself out there, and you have to have thick skin. You have to be bold because if you get – if you go for that big note and you get it wrong, people will know, and you got to come back the next time, and you got to do it again. And I certainly never thought of my father as, you know, as as submissive or anything like that, but but I hadn't thought of him in those kinds of – Bold terms, and it made taking up an instrument that hard that late in life, and even gutsier. Yeah, it's a gutsy instrument. Yeah, a gutsy instrument, and like a, and just a bold and romantic idea to just just to go for it. And I loved that. Now, on the subject of your personal life, you came out as gay at forty-two. That seems like a long time to hide a secret that big. What made you wait that long? Well, you know, I didn't really – the thing is my my friends and my family and my colleagues all knew. I mean I didn't – the thing is that in a way is because I've been working as a journalist, and you know this, the story is not yourself. So no one had come to me for – you know, to profile me or something. So I think that was probably part of it. I also was – I think a little bit – there was a sense of is – it's a little bit – um it's a little bit awkward sort of saying, I have a disclosure to make. It sort of almost felt a little bit self-important in a way, like to say, but, but I did feel that there came a time when I was actually being renewed at CBS News, and I thought, 
I kind of want – I want to be sort of on the record. I want somebody to say we're hiring you and we know who you are, not – you know, so that there's no two ways about it. And just sort of like to put it out there and just, you know, just say it. Now, the most surprising part of the story, to me at least, was that even after this happened, um, you got selected to do the first reading in a mass that the Pope held in New York City. This was in 2015. How did that come about? I mean, that's an amazing honor for anyone, but it must have had just a special resonance, too, that, that this happened after you'd, be, you'd been honest about your life. Well, I, um, I was the 107th caller to Q107. <laughs> okay. So that's how they do it. <laughs> I mean, oh, my God. I was like, yes, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Pope's stuck with you now. <laughs> right. Um, the um, I uh, I have been a um, I'm a big believer in inner city Catholic schools in New York, and I suspect in St. Louis, which I know has a very important proud uh, archdiocese. Um, uh, and so, for years, I've worked with an organization called the Inner City Scholarship Fund, sponsoring students and helping raise money. It's basically helps kids from economic economically disadvantaged homes of all faiths go to these really great schools that are really a great social safety net and undersung in New York City and again I suspect in other cities and so it was essentially uh, in a, in recognition of that and um um and it's sort of funny because the chancellor of the archdiocese apparently he told me that he went to the cardinal cardinal dolan he said i i think we should have mo do this reading and this reading though has to be done in spanish the way it was that the first reading of that mass was um had to be done in spanish and that the cardinal apparently said um okay but does he speak spanish (laughs) and that the chancellor said i don't know but he'll figure it out and (laughs) My mother is Colombian. My Spanish is not nearly as good as it should be, Um, but I did practice, and my best friend is Chilean, um, and so I I practiced with my friend Mario, and uh, and, um, uh, uh, my reading from not the book of Isaiah, but El Libro de Isaiah. So that's as good as it gets. (laughs) So... um, but yeah, it was very. I mean, it was uh, it was humbling to do that. Did you hear from people after that who were angry that you were willing to do that when the Catholic Church has still not been willing to give in full, full rights to gay people? Yeah, well, it's you know, it's funny actually. The the col- uh, I didn't want to Google myself or anything like that to see what people might have said, um, and then. Um, I haven't disclosed this, not that it's a particularly shocking thing, but uh, but actually the columnist Peggy Noonan for the, the Wall Street Journal, she wrote me a really lovely note, and she said I didn't – and she said, I know that some people have said some really unkind things, and I want you to know I think it's so great when I saw you doing this, and I'm happy for you, and those people are nuts. And and I actually didn't know that people were saying unkind <laughs> things, but but I really – it was very – it was really sweet of her to write that note. That's Mo Rocca, the author of Mobituaries. And we'll return to the conversation after a quick break to hear what questions the audience members had in store for Mo. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Welcome back to our conversation with Mo Rocca, recorded before a live audience on November 22nd. I started the audience participation part of the evening with a question from Scott in Florissant. He wanted to ask Mo, what would you want the first line of your obituary to be? Oh, Isn't that not a good so question? Sweet. <laughs> so, um, I would want it to be uh, Mo Rocca, comma, who made people interested in things they didn't expect to be interested in, comma, died today, period. He was 135. <laughs> We also have one from Lou Jobst, who's from High Ridge, Missouri, and uh, he or she says, which books have you read recently that are must-reads, in addition to mobituaries? Of course, you don't need to plug your own book uh, no, here. No, I, I won't do that. <laughs> um, what um, – uh, well, you know, I've begun reading my friend Jeannie Gaffigan's book, Jim, Gaff- uh, Jim Gaffigan's Wife, about um, about the, the brain tumor that she survived, um, and that that's really compelling – um, oh, I'm trying to think of – I mean it's it's embarrassing how little reading I've actually done while I've been writing because so much of, of it is research that I've been reading. But that's certainly one. And then um, 
And I'm also in the middle, now I'm just plugging friends, but I'm in the middle of my friend Peter Sagal's book, um, which is about running, but so much more than that, and about his life in running. Um, and he's the host of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and it's a great read. Andrew from Eureka wonders, what is the celebrity death that most saddened you and why? Well, I think that when celebrities die in the same day, it's kind of fascinating, maybe because it really highlights the randomness of life. Like, you know, Sammy Davis Jr. dying on the same day as Jim Henson. I mean, so much talent to go in one day. You know, they should have spread it out by at least 24 hours to give themselves their own news cycle. I mean, obviously, poor Farrah Fawcett dying on the same day as Michael Jackson. And I gave her a chapter in the book because I love Farrah. I mean, the 70s were a sluggish time, and she kind of livened things up. And, uh, And she clearly was a decent person the way what she did it towards the end of her life uh, Margaret Thatcher and Annette Funicello died on the same day and I just want like a reboot in the afterlife of Freaky Friday for the two of them to switch places <laughs> but I think that's sort of you know I think the saddest one is when Dick Sargent died on the same day as Kim Il-sung okay so Dick Sargent was the second Darren on Bewitched the, the, the two Darrens have vexed an entire generation this whole what happened especially if you watch them in repeats where each episode, would, there would be a different Darren. They were both played by men, main, na- men named Dick. Everyone knows that the first Darren was better, Dick York. He was like Jim Carrey good. He was so good. Then he, But he developed a drug dependency, and then he was replaced with Dick Sargent, who wasn't as good. Dick Sargent then, by all accounts a nice guy, had to go through life as like the second Darren, and then he dies the same day as Kim Il-sung. So think about it. On the one day that the second Darren expects to get some love, he's overshadowed by a genocidal maniac. <laughs> that is the saddest death of all. I mean, you make a really compelling argument. So. For Dick Sargent. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's a question we actually got from several people. Um, however, Karen from Baldwin is wondering, what is Mo short for? So when I was born in the late 60s, um, my father was in the Foreign Service, and he was the ambassador to Mozambique. I'm kidding. I'm lying. <laughs> this is why people in the Midwest are so polite. Because you all are inside. You're thinking, that's like bad I'm oh, sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. I can't, it's a library. I can't say that. You know, and, but you're like, oh, how polite. No. Um, so no, what, my mother what? was kind of a hippie. She was hitchhiking across the Mojave Desert when I was born. No. No, that's not true either. <laughs> uh, but it's short for Maurice. Okay. Yeah. I like I, those other two stories better. I speak with the pompatists of love. <laughs> I speak of the pompatists of love, whatever that is. <laughs> Now, Elisa Joyner um, from Detroit, actually, she's traveled very far for this very for this nice. uh, conversation. She asks, where have you been that has made you stop and say, wow, I can't believe I'm here? Boy, that's a great question. I mean, there, there's, there's so many places. Um, I mean, I was really excited when I went backstage in Miami and met Barbara Streisand. And I, and, and, um, and I was so excited. Um, and then he's like, yeah. <laughs> like, so, of course. Um, and she was really nice, really. And then she asked me what we should do about global warming. And it's just not something you can answer in a pithy, quick way. So did you disappoint her? I think I did. Oh, no. I think I did. No, I just I, – but I, I went, well, I, I – separate your papers and plastics. I mean, I, don't, I didn't know I, what to say at the moment when I wanted to talk about, like, you know, funny girl. And, and, you know. and your love of Barbara, I should say, like, never having met you prior to this night, I knew how much you loved Barbara because this is the through line that runs through this entire book is your well, love of Barbara Streisand. There, there is a chapter, yes, and it's true, <laughs> that is devoted to that. Yes. Yes. So I, and I so think, Fanny Bryce also right. gets an obituary. Exactly. Fanny yeah. Bryce gets one. <laughs> um, so Terry from St. Louis asks, who was your favorite? interview oh of all the interviews i've done just you know, on cbs sunday morning um i love angie dickinson i just am a big angie dickinson fan i think she is just terrific and she's one of my colleagues after i interviewed her one of my colleagues said god i hope that one day i can be um have the self-knowledge that she does she just is she's like she told me this i said are you a broad a dame or a gal and she said i'm all three and she really is and i played poker with her and she's a smart person and when i interviewed her she wasn't selling anything so she didn't you know and she had that quality that's boy it's hard of like 
not caring what other people think and really just sort of saying what was on her mind. And I liked her. I thought she was a very, very smart person. Is that the secret to being a good interview is to just not care what the audience well, is going to think? Well, I think so. I mean, I think like I, I prefer interviewing older people than younger people, even young, shiny stars. I never get excited about it. It's always a disappointment. And it's nothing against them. They just haven't lived long enough. And so it's not that interesting. So I have a real soft spot for the troopers. Like I did Mitzi Gaynor a, a couple months ago. And I have a <laughs> – yeah, she's – no. But, I mean, it's somebody – you know, and maybe that goes back to the Trump. It's somebody who's just keeps – and I think maybe that's something I I value in myself or I aspire to or something. Somebody who just keeps plugging away. I think it's a it's a virtue that's that can never be overvalued. It's it's um you know, I think that there's such a great importance placed on, oh, when she was eighteen, she knew what she wanted. When he was twenty two, he had it all figured out. And it's like, well, that's great for those people. But for the people who just keep on going and plugging it away and and are still trying to figure it out later on, I those are my people. Those people with the random yet impressive resumes. Well, or or but like something like somebody like Mitzi Gaynor, she had a film career and then she said and she was she said, you know what? It it it, it ended, and I wasn't that great on film, so she did one of the first great Vegas acts. And then when that was done, she went into TV and did a great variety show, and she just just kept going. I, I, stick-to-itiveness is a word that should be in the dictionary. It shouldn't, you know. So we did actually have another question about your conversation with Angie Dickinson, um, somebody who thought this was just such a great interview. And she wants to know, did she really beat you at poker? No, I actually beat her. And I oh, think you she was, beat her? Yeah, I okay. did. We, we, it, we didn't we – didn't, we weren't tricky with the editing. We just had to make it really short. But I kept getting um, – I guess like I kept getting straight since she was it was making her crazy. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so Stephen Hall from Chesterfield is wondering what is the most interesting presidential fact that you know. Well, one of the most interesting wild things that happened to me, I do a lot of presidential history pieces, is I went to interview the grandson of President John Tyler. Now, think about this. President John Tyler was born in 1790. As a nine-year-old, he went to Mount Vernon and had lunch with George Washington. His grandson plays tennis three times a week. So it's in 2019. And uh, Tyler sired 17 children with two different wives. I believe the youngest, he, he, he was in his... 70s or something when he had the youngest of them and then that one was in his late 60s or 70s when he had the man that's currently alive and it's one of those things that makes your brain go ah, like it just implode or something because it, it, it makes your head spin because it's also a great reminder of how short our history is in a way that three generations are spanning basically four centuries, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, and 2000s. And that was just wild. And I interviewed um, – Har- his name is Harrison Tyler and his wife, and I said to them, like, it would be great if you had a kid now to keep this thing going. <laughs> Were they receptive? And, and she pointed out it would have to be with a second wife. <laughs> So she was maybe not receptive to that. <laughs> right. she, I think she was like, that's fine with me. I've got other stuff to do. So, so we've got one question we're going to end on, and I think this is actually really an imp- – it's, the, it's the, uh, at the heart of everything that you do in Mobituaries, which I think is, is the perfect question to send us off to the signing in. And that is – and the person who came up with this extraordinary question didn't leave their name, so I can't give them credit. But um, what they're wondering is – what is one recurring lesson on living an extraordinary life that you learned while researching your book? One extraordinary lesson that I learned. Um, I think the lesson is um, – it's something I learned about myself or validated in myself in writing the book. And I think a lot of the people in this book um, are exemplars of that is be interested in what you're interested in. Meaning don't game the system. It's hard. Don't game the system and try to think, oh, other people will be interested in this. And I think it just goes in life in, in general. I think it's if, – if something – if you're drawn to something, you know, embrace that and don't fight that. And, um, you know, I've tried I've, – I've, 
the success so far of this book, which I'm very happy about, I think helps validate that, you know, that if you're interested in something and you execute it well enough, it will draw other people to it. And I think that's really, I think it's really important. Um, and Innovation Nation, there's one story, and I, and I wanted to include it in the book, and if there's a sequel, I will. It was about the designer Alexander Gerard, and he was, and I didn't know about him before, and he did the designs for Braniff Airways in the 1970s. And at a time when plaids and mixing patterns was seen as something that you didn't do, that's something he liked to do, and he did it, and he, and he did it really well, and he helped create a trend of doing it. And I, I'm not a designer. I can't, I can't articulate it anything, any better than that. But I, that really, I think that's really important. That was Mo Rocca, author of Mobituaries. Our conversation was recorded before a live audience at the St. Louis County Library headquarters on November 22nd. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening. I'm Sarah Fenske. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.